the meeting. Today on the call, I'm also joined by most of the APIP team, Aaron Benny Volrath, Rebecca Bernacki, and Emily Bell Diamond. Zach Simic is not able to be with us today, but you'll hear from the other members of our team, as well as it looks like 30 to 40 of our partners. So thank you all for joining the call today. Just a quick highlight and overview of the agenda. This is our chance to share what's happened this summer and to hear from you all about what's happened. We'll have aquatic program highlights of APIP and AWI, some of our terrestrial highlights with a focus on what's been happening with forest pests, great updates on what happened with our education and outreach this summer and our plans coming up for this winter. And then we've asked the partners who founded APIP to give a bit of an update as well. We'll take a quick break because we know this is a long meeting and a long time on Zoom today. And then we're going to come back and break into three small groups because that's going to be a much better way for all of our partners on the phone today to share updates about their work this summer as well. And before we end the call today, we had about 35 people who responded to our partner survey in September and we want to share the results of that with you. And there's one more piece of business before we get on to the main topic for today. And that is to have a, a bittersweet moment to, to say farewell to Aaron Venny Volrath from the Adirondack Park Invasive Plant Program. And then to say, congratulations, Aaron, and we can't, work with, can't wait to work with you in your new role as the New York State DEC Lake Champlain Coordinator. So Erin, as you know, has been with APIP for six years. She is extraordinary. Many of you have worked with her as a volunteer. Here's a picture of her doing water chestnut pulls. She works with our professional crew. She is a great educator, and she's also pioneered some of the new lake management tracker and bio base that a lot of our partners are using. So Erin, it is a, a fond farewell to you, but also looking forward to having you as a great partner for APIP in the years ahead. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Erin's part of the meeting. Oh, thank you so much, Tamara. Uh, it's, it's definitely a bittersweet, sweet call today. Um, so I'm requesting the remote quickly from everybody. And so, yeah, I'm, you know, I, you, at over six years, you don't really think about how much you, you've done with the program and changed it until you're writing those notes to the next person. And really, that'll take you on your position and really start to see how much things have changed. And really, all the work that's been done over the last six years is thanks to all of our partners. And the, the folks that I've gotten to work with so closely. So thank you all. So I think, oops, I gotta click the screen and hopefully I should be able to take this over. Um, so I'll quickly just give some updates from this last summer um, on the aquatics program. So um, many of you are very familiar with this graph. It's how we, one way that we keep track of the different surveys that we've done on our lakes and the Adirondacks since the early 2000s. Um, and so this year we were able to again up have a handful of new lakes that haven't been surveyed in the past. So we're up to, I think about 440 lakes have been surveyed in the Adirondacks for invasives. And we did have one new lake that, which I'll get into um, reported, but this is just a quick snapshot of the surveyed lakes. Um, so with those new numbers, we are over 75% of Adirondack waters that are still free of aquatic invasive species. And so um, we really continue to have a great opportunity in the Adirondacks to try to make sure that the lakes that don't have an invasive are kept that way. And then the ones that do have an invasive, the vast majority, over 90%, only have one or two invasives. Um, for, for those who, who aren't as familiar with aquatics, we have um, six target aquatic plants that we work with, and then five or two, I guess we're at six um, small bodied aquatic invasive species as well. Um, so this last summer, we were still able to go ahead with having some of our aquatic plant ID trainings, although they transitioned to online. Um, and so we offered two of our regular volunteer trainings in June. And then we also worked with the Adirondack Mountain Club to host a backcountry water training in July. And then I also got the opportunity this year to work with the Lake Placid Garden Club to do a training 
as well with them. This was our 19th season of monitoring in the region. And so we had a, over 130 volunteers that were able to help with surveys out on the ground, as well as our AIS early detection team, which was contacted through Ezra's group at Adirondack Research. With all those people out on the ground, we were able to survey 99 waterways in the Adirondacks. And so there was one new report found by the early detection team of Eurasian water milfoil in Weller Pond, which is a, connected by a short channel to Middle Saranac, which has had an established population of Eurasian water milfoil for a long time. Um, and so thank you so much, Ezra and your team for again, helping us with surveys out on the ground this last year. Um, they were in the region three, so the Northern region of the Adirondacks this last summer and we're able to survey a lot of lakes. I'm blanking on the number. I'm sure you, <laughs> you will be able to tell folks um, on our update, Ezra, how many of the team was able to cover. Um, and so as, as, as you know, they were out there looking for aquatic plants, as well as um, spiny and fish hook water fleas and Asian clams. Um, the lakes that they focus on in that region three are ones that have public access, have never been monitored for aquatic invasive species like Weller Pond, um, or have not been monitored in the last three years. And then we also have a list of vulnerable lakes um, from some different models that we focus on as well. Um, the team, when they're out, they collect the data using our mobile monitoring system called IPOMS. And then um, I know Zach is working with the IMAP crew to make sure that that data can then be crosswalked into IMAP invasives. Um, the team is able to use the IPMS data to then overlap it with some of the different bio-based data that they're collecting. And, and those who aren't familiar with the bio-based data, they're collecting sonar data as they're traveling around the lake doing the lake surveys. And then the sonar data can then be uploaded into the cloud-based software system of BioBase to create different maps that show the, or I can go to the next slide, I think. Um, and so each of the maps that they do show the depths of the lake, um, the littoral zone or where we have aquatic plants growing. And then if there's invasive aquatic plants, they're able to layer those over the native plant growth in the lake. Um, so that's that middle map that you're seeing. And then on the right, they also map the bottom hardness of the lake. And so these beautiful maps are made up um, every year by Ezra um, and are in our reports that are offered usually in the fall. And so those that this 2020 should be available um, in the coming month. I also wanted to say a big thank you to um, the volunteers that we had out also helping collect biobase while doing the maps. Um, we've had Scroon Lake Association helping with mapping um, Scroon Lake for the last few years, and they've done a great job of that big lake. And then also we had volunteers out of Shazy Lake um, helping fill in the gaps of that big lake's deeper areas for a beautiful biobase map. Um, we did have a few different management projects that APIP led up uh, um, in the, the region. So on Lake Alice, we had water chestnut um, removed, about 40 plants. The APIP team got a day out on the water to do that hand harvesting. Um, and so we continue to see populations of water chestnut on Lake Alice, um, but that's not surprising since we're hand harvesting. It'll take a few years to really knock the population down. Um, we also continued with hand harvesting of European frog bit in the Grass River. Um, this, this has been something that APIP has been doing since 2007. And uh, when we first started harvesting, we removed 36 buckets, five gallon buckets of the plants. And this year we were down to only two plants found. So it's a pretty quick management project that we do yearly to try to get rid of that population. Um, we had uh, I think six different groups working with us this summer on the lake management tracker program. And so for those who aren't familiar with it, it's, um, it's essentially a one acre grid of sites that volunteers from the lake associations visit to give a quick visual assessment 
of the abundance of the invasive and native plants. And then they're able to use that data every year to help assess whether or not their management efforts are having an impact on the invasive plants in their lake. So thank you for the volunteers who go out, who were out this summer helping to collect that data. And with that, that's my quick APIP highlight. Um, and I think we'll, I don't know if we're taking questions or we'll switch over to AWI's update for the spread prevention program. Tamara, you're still muted. Great, we'll have some highlights from Adirondack Watershed Institute first, and then Aaron will take a lot of questions. Um, and as you can tell, Aaron has done so much with this program. So I hope you can use the chat function and you know wish Aaron well in her new position. She'll be starting with DEC and the Lake Champlain program at the end of November, so she won't be far away. So now it's my pleasure to turn the microphone over to the Adirondack Watershed Institute. Adirondack Park Invasive Plant Program is only a small part of the great aquatic invasive species work that happens across the Adirondacks each summer. Many of our lake association partners are in our volunteers, but a big part of what happens with invasive species prevention and management in the Adirondacks happens at AWI. And so now I'll turn it over to AWI to give an update on the highlights of what they found this summer. All right, thank you very much for that. Uh, my name is Eric Paul. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, uh, I'm the director of the stewardship program with the Paul Smith College Adirondack Watershed Institute. Um, we unfortunately weren't able to get a presentation together by the deadline, but I will take you through all of this. And once I get to the data, I'll go as slowly as possible so that you can you can absorb it all. Uh, but to start off, the mission of the Adirondack Watershed Institute is to protect clean water, conserve habitat, and support the health and well-being of people in the Adirondacks through scientific inquiry, stewardship, and real-world experiences for students. Quite simply, we aim to protect clean water and stewardship program's goal is to prevent the transport of aquatic invasive species from one water body to another. So this marks the 20th year of the stewardship program and it's about the fifth or sixth year of us operating at this scale with decontamination stations that use hot water pressure washers. Our program operates at about, 100, at about 69 locations uh, in a combination of steward only sites, boat launches, with decontamination stations and roadside decontamination stations that are only decon stations. Uh, these 69 locations range from as far south as Broad Alban on Great Sockandaga Lake, all the way up the Lake Champlain shoreline to as far north as Black Lake near the St. Lawrence River and to as far west as Brantingham Lake. Uh, so now we'll move into the 2020 data here. And once again, I'll take it as slow as I can so that you can absorb some of this information without presentation. Um, in 2020, we inspected 122,988 watercraft, so almost 123,000 watercraft. Of those, uh, 72,464 were launching, 47,592 were retrieving, and 2,932 were inspected at a roadside decontamination station. Of these nearly 123,000 boats, uh, 22,967, or about 32%, hadn't been in the water within the last two weeks. Another 32,308 boats, or about 45%, were in the same water body last. Only 13,621 boats were in a different water body within the last two weeks, or about 19% of boats, while 3,568 boats were unknown. Uh, due to various regions. For those boats that we inspected that were in a different water body within the last two weeks, uh, the top 10 water bodies within the Adirondacks were Lake George, Great Sockandaga Lake, Scroon Lake, Lake Champlain, Mirror Lake, Lake Placid, Upper Saranac Lake, Lower Saranac Lake, Fourth Lake, and Racket Lake. 
the top 10 water bodies that boats had visited within the prior two weeks that fall outside of the Adirondack Park include Saratoga Lake, the Hudson River, the St. Lawrence River, the Atlantic Ocean, Lake Ontario, the Mohawk River, Oneida Lake, Delta Reservoir, Hinkley Reservoir, and Cayuga Lake. In 2020, the percentage of aquatic invasive species intercepted on launching boats was 0.4%, which is down from 0.5% in 2019. On retrieving boats, we intercepted AIS on about 5.4% of boats, which is down from 5.7% in the prior year. This year, we decontaminated 4,523 watercraft for a total percentage of about 3.7%. And our top 10 performing decon stations were the Welcome Center, uh, the rest stop at at Glens Falls with 538 decontaminations performed. Uh, the Rocky Mountain Trailhead, which is an inlet uh, at 381 decontaminations. Scroon Lake at Horicon with 306. Second Pond, uh, 295. Uh, South Bay on Lake Champlain with 291. Northville on Great Sockendaga Lake with 204. Upper Saranac Lake with 200. The Speculator Roadside Decon at 194. 163 at Caroga Lake. And 160 at Loon Lake. And three of those, Scroon Lake, Caroga, and Loon Lake, uh, are not operated by us. They are uh, partner organizations, and we handle the data for them within the park. So in closing, uh, we inspected nearly 23,000 more boats this year than we did last year. Um, although last year was a down year in general. Uh, so we're actually kind of getting back up to our, our, our normal statistics this year. And the percentage of AIS intercepted went down slightly on both launching and retrieving boats, which is actually a good sign. And uh, I'm not sure if you wanted to open it up for questions or move on from here, but that that concludes what we have. That is wonderful. And actually, I will open it up for questions in just a minute. And um, I just want to do a shout out and thank you to AWI. It is really a monumental that a effort that AWI leads in terms of spread prevention each year. I mean, really think about those numbers Eric just gave us, 123,000 inspections. That's a lot of people on the ground. That's a lot of eyes out on all of our boat launches. And then it's just staggering how much coordination it takes, and especially in a COVID year, to get everyone out there with the proper PPE and have that, have that effort going. And the fact that the data is amazing. So we have less than 20% of the boats that are our super, our potentials for spread. And we're really, through the work of AWI, able to do amazing spread prevention. So I do want to turn that over two questions. Erin, maybe if you stop, did you stop your slides? Okay. Not sure why. There yeah, I, should, I was able to return, I think. Um, okay. Yeah. So we, you can unmute to ask questions, and then you can also use the chat box to ask questions or raise your hand. Do we have any questions for either Erin or for Eric? One, um, can everyone hear me? One question in the box, um, in the chat box was asking about getting results for uh, a lake that AWI is serving. And so I just wanna point out to everybody um, that Zoe was able to answer that quickly. And so you can email Eric directly at epaul at paulsmiths.edu anytime and they'll be able to and AWI will be able to send you reports. Um, the 20 AWI's 2020 season report will be out this calendar year. And then Aaron, do you have any um, any reports or lake reports or or maps that or timelines about maps for different lakes? 
Yeah, um, so I know Ezra's gotten me a draft of, of their final report. So I think uh, that should be wrapped up by the end of November here, and then we'll be able to post it on our website when we have the final. And then, well, thank you, Erin, for that. And that actually is a little note about the website and getting lake reports and maps um, from um, uh, Adirondack Research. When they publish them for uh, APIP, we're working now to tease those out and have, well, they'll be a part of our website that has different lake maps and lake reports on it. And I'll be able to direct everybody to that um, later in the fall when it's complete. Thanks, Emily Bell. That's going to be a great opportunity. There's a lot of great information that's embedded in our annual aquatic report. And many of you who are working with different lake associations or the lakes where you live would like to be able to have quick, easy access to that. So with Emily Bell's help, we're going to break some of that out and hopefully make it more easily available for you so you don't have to drill down deep into the website to find it. Any other questions about aquatic work this summer? and we'll have a chance to share more in the small groups. So with that. I guess I have one question. Yeah. At Scroon Lake, we experienced um, probably a, uh, I'm not sure exactly what the exact percentage, but probably 60% of the European uh, milfoil was harvested as compared to kind of the trend or the or previous years. I'm, I'm just wondering if, um, Aaron, if, if that's what, did you see that across other lakes or was that somewhat uh, unique to Scroon Lake? Um, I hadn't heard from, I think, other lakes aside for, from Scroon that, that they were seeing that, but I, they could have and just not, not let me know. Um, it might be something in our small breakouts if, if there's any other lake associations joining. Will you, Tad, will you be in the um, aquatic one? I think I'm signed up for terrestrial. Okay, um, so I guess if, if any other lake associations experience the same thing with, with lower Eurasian water milfoil, definitely put it in the chat because I'd be curious to hear. Okay. All right. I'm gonna have us move over to our terrestrial report then, and I'm gonna turn it over to APIP's Becca Bernacki, who is leading our terrestrial program. Hi folks, I'm Becca Bernacki. I am the new terrestrial invasive species coordinator. And uh, let's, let's get right into it here. I guess I need to request remote control. And there we go. So I'm gonna start off today by talking about the two cornerstones of our terrestrial program. The first cornerstone we have here is our terrestrial early detection and rapid response team. These folks, along with the next position I'll talk about are really our boots on the ground out there getting the day-to-day -day work done for us. So our terrestrial early detection and rapid response team is a crew of four that we hire each season. The crew consists of one New York State certified pesticide applicator and three technicians or apprentices. This year we had three technicians. We're very fortunate in that we had this crew on for an extra week this year. So we had them for 15 weeks this year from June 15th to September 24th. Getting the crew on that ground that early allows us to really hit those early phenology species so we can get them and treat them before they set seeds and can spread further. The team is really awesome and completed 2,400 hours of work for us this year. And on the right here, we have pictured Richard, who is our team lead. And on the left, we have Danny, who is one of our three crew members um, under Richard. So what did the crew do this year? Um, so let's, let's look at some of the results. So if you look at the map on the left here, I'm sure you're looking at that and going, man, there's a lot of lime green and pink and dark green on there. And those are our three most common species that our crew is out treating. That lime green color is Phragmites or common reed grass. The pink is purple blue stripe and the darker green is Japanese knotweed or knotweed species. Um, these are the species that we see most often and treat most often, but they're far from the, our highest priority species. Our higher priority species are the species that we see less often, like Tree of Heaven, which is, you know, there's one or two brown dots on there and Swallow Wart, which is dark purple, and there's a handful of, of points on there. 
So our team really works and uh, hits a lot of road corridors, forest preserve lands and private properties. And they this year completed 2,200, over 2,200 assessments. So they go to, to sites, evaluate their, them for inv invasive species and map them. Um, they also performed 425 either mechanical or tra chemical treatments of invasive species. And a real highlight here was that they had over 750 sites that they visited that were historically invaded with invasive species that no longer had invasive plants observed. So that's that's roughly one third of the sites they visited. So that, that's a real success and shows the success of this program over time. The next cornerstone, which I mentioned of our program is the Invasive Species Management Steward, formerly known as our campground steward. Uh, this year, we were very fortunate to have Adalia, who's pictured here on the right. And then Adalia did a lot of great work this summer. She visited all 39 DEC administered campgrounds that are land based. She also visited 75 recreational access points um, and surveyed those. And those include boat launches, trailheads, those sort of high use areas where we kind of expect to see invasive species introduced. Um, in total, she assessed over 1,200 sites and had over 700 sites with no plants observed. So uh, the invasive species program showed even more success than our, our, uh, our crew, pro crew, um, where Adelia saw over half of the sites that she visited no, no longer had invasive plants present. Um, Adelia did a lot of hand pulling of invasive species this year, and she hand pulled over 15,000 plants this year, and the bulk of those were garlic mustard. So as I said, the bulk of those plants that Adelia pulled were, were garlic mustard, and garlic mustard is one of the key species that the campground steward is out there looking at. So I, I figured I'd show you a graphic so showing the success of this program over time. If you look at the left Y axis, we have the number of plants removed and those are represented by the green bars on this chart. And on the right Y axis, we have percent of campgrounds invasive invaded, and that is the black line graph. So if we look at 2012 and 2013, when this, this position first came into fruition, you'll see that, you know, they pulled upwards of 60,000 plants and 49% of the campgrounds were invaded. If you'll also note the green, or I'm sorry, the blue stars, those show years where management was incomplete due to limited program constraints, you know, the, they ran out of time to get to places or phenology ran out on them. So they're pulling that many plants when they weren't even getting to everywhere they wanted to go. You compare that to 2020, Adelia pulled just about 14, just over 14,000 plants this year. So about a quarter of what was pulled eight years ago. And we have a record low of 38% of the campgrounds were invaded. So some really great work going on there. So if we combine those all together and, and look at what was done this summer as, as a whole, we've performed over 3,400 assessments and we had over 1,500 sites with no plants observed. Since the program inception uh, roughly 20 years ago, APIP has documented over 6,000 cases of invasive species. And this summer we found 450 new infestations. And it's important to note that those may not be brand new infestations, they're just new to us infestations. I want to move on a bit and talk about another program that we took on this summer, and that's our Knotweed Management Partnership. This program was originally known as the Regional Inlet Invasive Plant Program, or RIP. So if you hear me refer to it as RIP, that is why. This program was founded in 2008 by citizen scientists and, and the town of Inlet and other entities. It very quickly expanded thanks to the efforts of volunteers and that in, you know, expanded geographically. So in 2015, Hamilton County Soil and Water District took over administration of this program from the town of Vitlant. And in 2020, we at APIP began administering this program and we renamed it the Knotweed Management Partnership to highlight the partnership between us and the volunteers that make this program possible, as well as highlight the broader geographic area now that the program is extended outside of the town of Inlet. The goal of the Knotweed Management Program is to reduce the severity of high priority infestations to support private landowners in controlling knotweed infestations on their own. So what does that mean? If you look at this picture on the top, we have a house full and a yard full of knotweed. You know, if you were a private landowner and this was your house, it'd probably be pretty hard for you to control on your own. So our goal is to assist landowners that are in this situation and provide a certified pesticide applicator to come out and help treat that knotweed for a few years to knock it back to a condition where a landowner can take care of it and hopefully eradicate it over time. 
So as I mentioned, this is a partnership and volunteers are critical. Our role at APIP in the Knotweed Management Partnership is to provide administrative support and do all that background work. So when permissions come in, we file them, we coordinate volunteers, we coordinate with a certified pesticide applicator to go out and do those treatments and, and take in all the records and, and take care of those sorts of things. The volunteers here are really the folks doing the hard work. They go out and assess sites prior to treatment to see the extent of knotweed. They secure the permissions. We need both indemnity forms for TNC and a contract for the certified pesticide applicator and the volunteers are critical at obtaining those permissions. They report new sites to us. And another key thing they do is these folks conduct outreach and let folks, other folks in the community know about invasive species and what they can do to help. So we got off to a bit of a late start with success and faced some challenges due to, 20, due to COVID, but we really consider 2020 to be a success. We took on this program this year and our volunteers were able to secure over 60 unique landowner permissions leading to treatment of about hundred sites. Um, and those treatments are either done via a foliar spray on the leaves, which you can see in the bottom picture here, or via a stem injection, uh, which is pictured on the top. To kind of highlight the success of this program before we even took it over, about 25% of the, or I'm sorry, about 25 of the sites that volunteers or our applicator visited no longer had plants present. So this program's been pretty successful in the past. The last thing I want to talk to you about today is giant hogweed. And giant hogweed is a species that we work with state partners on to control. We're very fortunate here in the Adirondacks that we only have 16 known sites. So if you look at this chart, um, the giant hogweed program started formally in 2010. Um, on the y-axis, we have number of infestations and on the x-axis, we have years over time. So a gray color means that we didn't have much data, any data on that site yet. Um, that orangey color is that is a site we're currently managing. Green is means it's locally eradicated and yellow is kind of in the middle where we didn't see plants this year or maybe the year before, but we're not considering it eradicated yet. So the 16 known sites in the Adirondacks, um, only four sites had plants present and all were young pre-reproductive plants, meaning that they weren't set, giving off seeds yet and contributing to the seed bank. So we're pretty excited to announce that 75% of the historically managed not giant hogweed plants are now eradicated from the Adirondacks. Um, kind of an interesting last note I'll leave you with is while we were out surveying for giant hogweed, we were lucky enough and terrified enough to come across a, a rattlesnake, which is always exciting to see. And with that, I will pass the torch to Tamara, our program coordinator. All right. And I will have a chance to talk about forest pests in just a minute. I did want to do a shout out to, uh, again, as Becca said, first to Doug Johnson, who is one of the founders of the RIP program and a financial supporter of the program, as well as all of the volunteers who work with RIP. So uh, as Becca pointed out, we, the APIP program and our professional crew is out treating sites around the Adirondacks. Much of that is happening on state land or on DOT right-of-ways because we simply don't have the capacity to respond to every landowner who wants to have help. And so those RIP, the Knotweed Management Partnership volunteers are really the missing link. That's a great thing we've been able to add this year is that the volunteers are the liaison with the landowner and secure all of those permissions so that we can have the applicator go out. There's no way that APIP could coordinate all of that private landowner outreach. So we'll be looking forward to working on that next summer along with continuing all of the other work that Becca was talking about. I know a lot of you also responded to our survey that you had questions and wanted to hear more about what was happening with forest pests in the Adirondacks this year. And so I'm happy or sad to give you that update. Forest pests are a large problem across the country, but we in New York are really the hot spot. You can see that because of the St. Lawrence Seaway and because of the ports of New York and New Jersey, we are really the epicenter of forest pest threats in the United States. And the potential for dramatic or catastrophic change in our forest composition right now is coming primarily from forest pests more so even than climate change. And climate change is an important way that our forests here in the Adirondacks have an opportunity to serve the future. 
The Nature Conservancy has recently finished a nationwide mapping project to look at areas that will be most important to mitigate the impacts of climate change. And you can see here, this is the Nature Conservancy's resilient and connected landscape maps. But particularly that area of blue is where we already have high diversity. And that's where it's expected that species that are trying to migrate and move in order to advance ahead of climate change will be finding refuge. And so it's of particular concern with this great diversity and climate flow zones that we have here in the Adirondacks, what might happen with forest pests. So that landscape was pretty threatened this summer. We, you all have been following some of the news, but we had the first reports of emerald ash borer in the park and also the first major infestation of hemlock woolly adelgid. So let's talk a little bit about emerald ash borer. We were really fortunate that Becca joined us this summer. Becca is our expert in emerald ash borer. She did a lot of her prior work on emerald ash borer. We actually, there were 11 new confirmed locations this year within our prism. And most of those were up in the northern parts of Franklin and Clinton County. But we do have four confirmed locations now in the Adirondack Park. And I wanna thank our partners at the Department of Transportation because it was one of the DOT staff members who contacted us and said, hey, I'm out here at the, I've been out at the Warren County Canoe Access site on the Scroon River. This looks like Emerald Ash Borer to me. And so we, Becca was able to get right out there and said, yep, uh, this looks exactly like Emerald Ash Borer. And in fact, we partnered with Department of um, Environmental Conservation, which sent off samples to the lab and it's confirmed that that is Emerald Ash Borer. So we wanted to work pretty quickly on this project just to see what was happening. So with the Department of Transportation, with the Department of Environmental Conservation, we set out a five mile radius survey zone around that first infestation. And with DEC and APIP, we surveyed basically all along the roads and in some of the campgrounds within that five mile radius. Pretty good news in that on the west side of 87 in that area, we didn't find any indications of, of ash trees infected by emerald ash borer. On the east side of the highway, the news wasn't as good. We did see there's about 30 unconfirmed cases and those are not all on our map here. The unconfirmed cases are not mapped publicly, um, but we just put out some of the outlier ones there in the fact that they are extending outside of that five mile radius that we surveyed. And then there was one other confirmed case further down, further south towards Warrensburg. So in response to that, APIP has sent out materials to all the campgrounds in this area, encouraging people, please do not move firewood. And as you know, many of you know, ash is a great tree for firewood. So there's the potential not only for it to spread if landowners are cutting trees there and selling firewood in their little firewood boxes, but then to also be taking trees out of this infected zone and bringing them further into the Adirondacks. So what's next with that? There's not an effective or rapid response treatment for emerald ash borer but we will be working with DEC next year to expand those surveys now out from where those outlier sites are. And there is a biocontrol available for emerald ash borer, but you need to have a minimum of a 40 acre woodlot with about 25% ash component that are already showing signs of infestation. The good news is our infestations aren't that great, that big yet. And the also good news is that the Adirondacks doesn't have that high an ash component usually. The downside to that is that we don't have perfect sites for biocontrols, but we are working with DEC to identify if there might be any candidate sites for a biocontrol release. And we'll be doing definitely some more trapping next year. And we will be putting a lot more emphasis on our Don't Move Firewood campaign. So about a week after we heard about the Emerald Ash Borer, we got news about hemlock woolly adelgid. It was a pretty tough summer on top of a pandemic. 
I wanted to talk a little bit about hemlock woolly adelgid and the potential impacts on the Adirondacks. So as I said, ash is not a major component of the Adirondack forest. It is certainly in some of our lowland and in our riparian areas, a very important component of the forest. Hemlock is much more ubiquitous across our landscape and much more dense. Thanks to some of the work from Adirondack research, we do have great maps available of where heavy hemlock density is in the Adirondacks. And I've overlaid that on that resilient and connected landscapes map. And so we're gonna focus in down here on Lake George watershed area. And you can see that there's a lot of areas of dense hemlock. Some of those stands can be upwards of 75% or more of hemlock. And so loss of those hemlocks would completely change those watersheds and those forests. So many of you followed the hemlock woolly adelgid outbreak that was found on Prospect Mountain in 2017. There was relatively good news with that as there were only about three trees that were infected. They were able to be treated. We are presuming that that site was eradicated. It was a quick, effective, rapid response. Just what we wanna be able to do when we find a new species in the Adirondack Park. Then this summer, actually a camper reported finding suspect hemlock woolly adelgid on Glen Island, reported it into the IMAP invasive system. Alerts went out and the Department of Environmental Conservation was able to go out and confirm that it was indeed hemlock woolly adelgid. And that spurred an entire rapid response effort led by DEC and a lot of our partners, including Becca and Zach Simic, went out and helped. And there has been a delimitation survey of that original infestation site showing about 200 plus acres are actually involved in that site. And then another 13 acre site has been found around shelving rock. I also want to note, and we'll talk a little bit more too, about New York State's Hemlock Initiative, which is run out of Cornell University. Some of the best researchers in the country on Hemlock Willie Adelgid are available to us right through Cornell. And Mark Whitmore, the lead scientist, has spent most of the summer, I think, out on Lake George helping to survey. And I'll talk about some of the, a little bit of the innovative research they're doing, and we'll hear more about that at our February webinar that we'll be having on hemlock woolly adelgid. So the Department of Environmental Conservation it has been focused this summer on trying to figure out how to control what's happening here at that Glen Island site. And yet a lot of our uh, nonprofit partners were wanna make sure what else is happening in the watershed. So with some quick action by the Fund for Lake George, Lake George Land Conservancy, many other partners here in Lake George, we have been able to launch a Save the Hemlocks initiative, which is a real public-private partnership. There's four different potential efforts that are happening, and a lot of resources are, are happening in each of these stages and overlapping somewhat. And again, we're going to have a full debrief of all of this and next steps at our February Hemlock Woolly Adelgid. Uh, webinar. But DEC has been leading stage one delimitation and control. They had a massive mobilization effort with over 20 people out each day trying to treat the hemlock woolly adelgid and they have wrapped that up for this year. In the meantime, many of the partners wanted to know, well, where else is this outside of the main infestation? And so with funding through Lake George Land Conservancy, Adirondack Research Team was hired and was able to mobilize a four-week intensive survey effort with funding uh, through the Fund for Lake George and, again, many other partners we're also working on setting up a remote sensing project this winter, which is gonna help us direct where our on the ground survey crews go next year. And then after that, we wanna see what happens with the rest of the Adirondacks. Just a quick minute on each of these steps and then we'll open it up for plenty of questions. 
So those field surveys, that stage two survey, it was a month long blitz of uh, people I'm seeing my staff nodding, many of us uh, wandering, uh, not aimlessly, wandering very purposely throughout all of the areas of the watershed we could get to. Um, we have actually completed over 300 plots. A large majority of those were done by the pro crew that Ezra operates out of Adirondack Research and then by a number of other partners. So what we were surveying for out there is um, evidence of hemlock woolly adelgid, but it's not the best time to survey. For our volunteer surveys that'll be happening next year, the best time is March and April and May where you can really see that wool. Um, here, we were out often uh, using bright, bright, lights and hand lenses, really trying to find just the tiniest little poppy seed basically and wrapped in a little bit of white wool. So a real needle in a haystack hunting project. Sometimes we, there was evidence of wool from prior years, but we were able to, as I said, get out to over now 300 mm. plots and two new infestations other than the ones up at Shelving Rock and Glen Island were found. Dome Island, which is owned by the Nature Conservancy, and then a site on public land just in off of Pilot Knob. The Nature Conservancy was able to work really quickly and we have just completed treatment um, on Dome Island. We treated 342 trees with a combination of two insecticides. And with the work of the Hemlock Initiative with uh, out of Cornell, they have set up some permanent plots on the island. They're taking samples of branches from the high canopy, mid canopy, low canopy. They're doing really cutting edge environmental DNA analysis on those. We're gonna learn a lot more about what's happening with the Adelgid because of the work on Dome Island. And then the state will be leading up efforts next spring about what to do out at Pilot Knob. That was found just too late this year to be able to mobilize resources for that. We're not anywhere close to done on HWA, again, through great fundraising efforts led by the Fund for Lake George. There will be a remote sensing project going on this winter that'll be led by Andy Reinman from the City University of New York. He's been doing this work in the Catskills already. We'll have a lot more on this again at our February webinar. Quick, quick look at it is you look at it, Landsat data and it will ideally be able to tell us where there are stressed hemlock trees. It's not gonna tell us that there's hemlock woolly adelgid in that tree, but it'll tell us where there are areas of stressed trees and it can be very effective at that. And then that's where we will be sending out ground crews next summer to see if it is further spread of hemlock woolly adelgid. If that all goes well with support from the Department of Environmental Conservation, we hope to be able to do that remote sensing project either next year or the year after for the entire Adirondacks. So that's a lot on all of our terrestrial work this summer, as well as on hemlock woolly adelgid and, and <clears throat> emerald ash borer. Happy to take a few questions. And again, we've got some great webinars that will be coming up this winter to go into more detail on both of those species. So we have a few um, questions already from the chat. I know a lot of folks have questions, so I'm going to just jump into these. Um, the first is, oh, sorry, um, is if we still have a, um, a not, so going back to knotweed, we've covered a lot of things. Does APIP have a knotweed volunteer program in Saranac, in the Saranac Lake area? To Becca and Tamara. We do have a volunteer in the Saranac Lake area. Due to COVID-19, he was not able to be very active this year. So we did not have as much happening in that region. Great. And we'll, we'll be expanding programs going forward. Um, and everything is in flux with COVID. So the second question is, um, I'll just address that this presentation or recording of this presentation as well as slides will be available on our website and I'll send it out after when it's all uploaded to everyone who's participated today. Um, we got a few questions about that. Um, we have another comment um, and this is more related to the 
Ash from Everett McNeil about the East Lake um, Scroon Lake Association and asking the EC to reduce the distance that allow the allowable distance that firewood can be moved from 50 miles to 25 miles. Um, I will say that in our workshops about preventing the spread of invasive species in our fall workshops, we discuss this quite a bit in two different events um, and that it is relative and folks should be paying attention in our small area, those 6 million acres isn't that small, but in our prison region, we're promoting a much smaller distance than 50, uh, 50 miles. But I'll let Becca and Tamara answer more. Yeah, I think you really covered it well, Emily. Um, uh, the state's kind of relaxed regulations around ash around the state as Emerald Ash Borer has become more established, but that 50 mile firewood um, transport law does still exist. Um, I've mentioned in the past in a few other webinars that, you know, transporting firewood 50 miles in the Adirondacks, if you took ash that was infested with emerald ash borer to an area 50 miles away, it could be very devastating as you, you very, very easily spread that past. Um, that's likely what how the past spread of the Scroon River site in the first place. So getting that limit reduced is, is important. And I think it's also important to note that there is just general don't move firewood, but there is a prohibition on transporting invaded, invasive species like emerald ash borer. And so if there is firewood that has emerald ash borer in it or raw saw logs, you cannot transport that wood. So that's important to know um, those people, if you're cutting trees and you have that infected firewood as if it's actually infected and you can see under the bark, the channels that look just like emerald ash borer, you cannot transport that wood. But that's really hard for most people who are buying wood and selling wood to know about. We have a few more questions in the chat. Um, Steve Young asks, uh, what do you think about uh, burned Blossie's recommendation that one should not be pulling garlic musk? I actually have, have not, not read that article or, or that recommendation, Steve. So if you wouldn't mind forwarding that to me, that'd be fantastic. Steve, if you want to, you know, go off mute and comment, we'd love to hear more. some garlic mustard controversy. Um, <laughs> so we'll move on to um, the next question. Um, is there a wish list of sites you would like volunteers to survey in the Lake George area this winter? Uh, that's a really great question. I'll talk about it a little bit more in the education and outreach component that we're gonna jump into next, but maybe Tamara and Becca have more comments. Absolutely anyone who's across the entire state or the region who can find and see a uh, hemlock woolly adulgid, so definitely put it right into IMAP Invasives or call DEC or call us. Uh, and then Emily Bell's going to talk about a coordinated effort that we hope to pull together with a bunch of partners for next spring when the identification is going to be easier for volunteers to see out on the ground when there's a lot of wool uh, in the trees. Great. Um, the gar in the chat, uh, we have some more garlic mustard discussion. Um, maybe this would be a really interesting talk to have. We don't ha we don't talk enough about annuals, or we haven't this past year. So maybe we could have a an annuals talk um, in this early spring before they start coming up. I think that would be really interesting because one thing that APIP is you know dedicated to is understanding that science changes and evolves and we need to change and evolve with it and be um, on the cusp of understanding all the most current research and, di and different ideas about management. Um, some folks are saying that HWA has wool right now and uh, that's a great point as well and we can connect you to different resources of training uh, that our other partners at different prisms have been putting on this fall as well to get your community activated or your organization activated or uh, volunteers that you serve activated, just hit the ground running. Great. This is Carolyn Marshner from the New York State Hemlock Initiative. 
Hi, oh. Caroline. <laughs> <laughs> um, so um, across the southern part of the state, HWA is already in its second instar, so it's actively putting on wall, and it should be relatively easy to see at this time. Most of our volunteers are not out just because they're um, cautious about being out during hunting season. Um, but as soon as hunting season is wrapped up, if you have areas that are have little enough snow um, that you can get to them, um, or trails that are accessible through uh, skiing or snowshoeing, um, absolutely winter is a great time to survey for HWA. And the reason I was asking about the if you have a list of areas is that we have a volunteer that just signed up this week who wants to get out and do some surveying for you. Right. So if you we, guys have a wish list, let us know. We have not had a chance to put the wish list together yet uh, because we have been spending as many days as possible uh, on the DEC site and then on the Dome Island infestation and running those two, 200 plus more plot surveys. So we do have an effort planned coming up, but we don't have a volunteer wish list right now. Okay. But that doesn't stop volunteers from going out and doing the surveys. Thank you. I'm glad to have you on the call. <laughs> I think Emily Bell, should I turn it over to you to talk about our education and outreach programs or are there any more questions? I don't see any more in the chat, um, but we're always available to discuss um, with everyone all the time. Um, and this might be a good transition point. So in addition to bringing on Becca Bernacki this summer as our terrestrial coordinator, Emily Bell joined us and moved from Oregon in the midst of COVID and um, landed uh, barely in time to launch our great new website and then quickly put together an amazing education and outreach program this summer. She's going to talk a little bit about that and what's next. Great. I'm just asking... Erin could monitor the chat, that would be super. Um, great, so we could, uh, Tamara, if you progress the slides. Thanks. Um, so yes, uh, it's so interesting to, one of my first activities coming on to APIP was our spring partner meeting, and now it's already fall, and it feels like that was like seven years ago. Um, so thank you all for having me and getting to know me this past summer. It's been, or spring, summer, fall, it's been wonderful getting to know all of you and to get um, back on the ground in New York. I'm from New York and my husband has partially grown up here in the Adirondacks throughout his entire life. So we're really happy to be back on the East Coast and serving this community. Um, other than starting remotely in Oregon, I'd say the biggest challenge to our education outreach program this year has been one, really formally starting this program up um, where Aaron and Zach had previously, and our, our seasonal education person had previously worked tirelessly to make all of these educational um, opportunities available to the community. We never had a full-time person on like a number of other prisms. So it's really exciting to be building this program up and it's, it's ever evolving and changing and growing. Um, but in doing so, we pivoted very quickly to an online format, as everyone here on this call has also done. Um, so as someone who's been in the field for a long time, this was a very sudden change and relearning how to do everything I've ever done. Um, so I was really uh, honored and uh, touched to see what it, that so many people enjoyed these workshops this year. Um, it's, it means a lot, and we're all really excited to have provided uh, so much great education to folks and, you know, break down a lot of barriers to access by having things online. It's a big area. It's a lot of ground to travel. Um, we have a lot of seasonal challenges here as well. A lot of internet challenges, a lot of electricity going out all the time. So um, thank you everyone who's participated this past year. From June to September, APIP um, hosted uh, 11 different workshops for almost 400 different folks. Um, Erin mentioned a number of workshops she also was able to uh, host or participate in with community partners. So when I say these 11 workshops, these were APIP specific. And those brought together a lot of different partners from eight different organizations in order to lead and promote these educational opportunities. So some of our most popular workshops this past spring and summer, uh, managing milfoil and uh, 
invasive an intro to invasive jumping worms as an emerging species in the Adirondacks wouldn't have been possible without uh, different partners coming and helping um, spread the word about these important species and prevention methods. Uh, we covered everything from using IMAP and introduction to that to terrestrial species and aquatic invasive species, how to survey lakes, knotweed identification and management, primarily for private landowners in support of the programs Becca mentioned earlier, um, working with transportation professionals and different municipalities across the PRISM region was excellent and talking about prevention strategies while you're um, managing road crews, managing milfoil I mentioned, and then we jumped into a couple different spread prevention specific workshops based on different, um, different avenues for spread. And we'll be going with that kind of theme next year as well. Um, APIP also created its own Instagram account this year. So if you're on Instagram, please follow us at ADK Invasives. Uh, social media has been growing and it's an excellent way um, to reach folks where they're at, especially younger people um, and different organizations to just get the word out about events. And we hope to be using it more as an educational tool to highlight different species to be on the lookout for um, throughout the year, throughout the season, terrestrial and aquatic alike, um, to match up with seasonality of our area. Um, we've also gone through a pretty hefty website redesign, which uh, a lot of, we've gotten a lot of feedback that people really like our new website. Uh, it is not just a website, but we use it as an educational tool and a place to store a lot of resources for the community we serve. So there's always more room to grow, and um, you'll all have my you all have my contact information. So if you ever find I have a reading disability, so if you ever find a spelling error, just email me, and I'm happy to help. And going into 2021, we'll be um, building the website up even more. So if there's ever tools you're missing from the previous work uh, previous website, um, my I'm always available to talk about it and find it for you. Going and then touching on um, and going into 2021 and touching on the topics we've been discussing about hemlock woolly adelgid, emerald ash borer as emerging species in our area. Um, we are working and as Tamara said, we've been <laughs> we've been really busy with the early detection rapid response process with HWA and EAB in our area, um, and so we've been gathering partners and creating a strong plan to get on the ground in the winter. So upcoming workshops we have scheduled with partners. Uh, in January, we'll be teaching and leading a preparing for emerald ash borer on your property. So this is very much a management workshop and in partnership with the St. Lawrence Soil Water Conservation District. In February, we'll be uh, leading a hemlock woolly adelgid impacts identification and citizen science monitoring workshop with partners from ADK Mountain Club and Lake George Lands Conservancy, potentially a few other partners as well across prism boundaries. And so this will be, you know, taking what you learn in the classroom portion that APIP is leading and then getting out into the field with our community partners, um, snowshoeing safely outside in small groups, uh, hiking. Hopefully we'll have snow, so hopefully it'll be snowshoeing um, and working around the Lake George area to find different invasive species. We are going to be, I love fishing, so we're going to be teaching a prevent to spread for anglers workshop in preparation for trout season opening on April 1st. And then I also have a horticulture background and we'll be working to talk about more native plants that you could be using in the Adirondacks come April. Although folks won't be really gardening till June. Um, more website improvements, as I mentioned, and a lot of work has gone into really thinking about and boiling down APIP's volunteer program. So how can we really streamline processes in order to help them grow? Where can we put volunteers on the ground? What do our volunteers need? And what do our community partners need that we can connect volunteers to? So uh, with a lot of these education initiatives, we're also building up our volunteer programs. Um, as I mentioned, we haven't had this position, so you know we're that I'm in. So we're really building up a lot of stuff um, and helping, you know, carry home what Aaron and Zach have built over the last number of years um, into a formalized 
program. And then this winter, um, and this also reflects a lot of what folks mentioned in the partner survey we sent out prior to this event, uh, we'll be redesigning a lot of our printed materials in order to help uh, increase that, the scope and effectiveness of our prevention methods or our prevention messaging and also um, to identify different species when you're out in the field using IMAP. Um, so it's really exciting stuff. Um, and yeah, I'm just really excited to be here and serve you all. And much more to come about our programs for 2021 as we get into um, some of the later parts of the meeting and you'll hear from all of the, you'll have lots of information about these upcoming workshops. Before we take a little bit of a break this morning, I did want to make sure we had a chance to hear from the partners who founded APIP. And as you all know, um, the Adirondack Park Invasive Plant Program is really the strength of all the work that happens collectively with all of the partners. It is not just the APIP staff, even though you've been very patient listening to most of us this morning, we will have a chance to have a lot of updates uh, after we get into the small groups as well. We did think about that today, and I know that our fall partner meeting, we're usually sitting in a big room places and people can go around the room and share their updates. So with the Zoom format, we'll do that in small groups just after the break. But the other founding partners include, the after the Nature Conservancy is Department of Environmental Conservation, Adirondack Park Agency, and DEC. And we wanted those founding partners to have a minute to also give some updates. So I'll turn it over to DEC. I do believe um, that Josh Teal is on the phone. Um, uh, I am, can you hear me? All right, yeah, great, thanks Josh. Awesome. Uh, yeah, good morning everyone. Uh, I just wanted to make some uh, overarching comments and remarks about uh, sort of this year and some of the things that have uh, obviously uh, precipitated and, and impacted uh, our programs at large. Uh, obviously, with uh, the COVID pandemic, there's you know been a lot of concern and um, uh, adaptation to personal safety. So that's affected uh, you know APIP and partners and DEC, you know field crews and office time and all that sort of stuff. Um, but it's also had a roll-on effect, um, as I'm sure everyone is aware, as to the state uh, fiscal situation. So the state is in. Um, is in a, a pretty big hole right now that has had uh, impacts to uh, how effective we've been in, in dispersing or, or utilizing uh, our available funds. Um, so, you know, as a case in point and, and to highlight sort of everyone's um, uh, response to this and give credit to the partners for, for flexibility, you know, as an example, uh, the boat steward program in, in Adirondack uh, primarily uh, led by uh, AWI. Uh, early on, you know, in the, in, before the season, we were, th there was great uncertainty whether the program would even um, start because of uh, concerns about personal safety and then and also uh, follow on effects with, with, uh, with payment systems and such. Um, but, you know, they and, and other partners uh, in Adirondacks and statewide uh, went to great efforts to uh, to ensure that um, the public and, and workers were safe, uh, and then also uh, went to great efforts to, to uh, stretch themselves um, from a contractual standpoint and make sure that, that, that they still uh, delivered uh, uh, upon uh, obligations. But uh, this, you know, really highlights uh, a strong partnership and um, willingness to work together uh, and this has been replicated in, in a number of other uh, of our programs um, in the Adirondacks and, and uh, statewide. So uh, credit to all of our partners. It's really important and uh, greatly uh, appreciated uh, all of your involvement. Um, so, you know, it's elephant in the room or still a looming issue, the, the budget issues for us. And uh, APIP has been uh, very flexible in trying to reduce uh, immediate costs for 2020, but as a general um, development, you know, there are, uh, we're working with, with TNC and APIP to uh, adjust some flexibility in their contract for, for future years to, to uh, utilize funds for various uh, 
some contractual and, and in-house uh, work. So that's uh, an ongoing discussion, but but uh, just want everyone to know that we're trying to be as flexible as possible and, and still get uh, the good work done that we can. Um, in general, uh, and this applies to APIP and any partners, you know, grantee recipients and such, uh, anyone with existing commitments to the, to the department, to the state, uh, those are all being honored. Uh, and just wanna make that clear. So uh, if you have existing contracts, there's no question uh, that uh, work is being reimbursed and, and that we're still planning to see the, the full, uh, you know, results of those, uh, of those arrangements. Um, uh, I, others have I've already mentioned aquatics and, and for those in those particular arenas, and other if there's uh, breakout groups or whatever, then you know, I'll, I'll leave the details for, for that. Uh, same for terrestrial, we heard a lot about HWA and EAB. Um, but a couple other little things that are you know, uh, on the horizon or, or maybe something to look forward to as a little bit of a silver lining. Um, the, DEC has over the past uh, year or more been, been working on a, a feature length hour long documentary and we're getting close to the finish line on that one uh, and hopefully uh, we'll have a, a final product uh, in the near future perhaps over winter uh, and that will be uh, you know an exciting um, uh, product to to release to to the public and partners. Um, I've said this in the past, but uh, there has been some recent development on the, the further uh, funding of uh, the Invasive Species Clearinghouse, nyis.info. So that will be a, another valuable resource, a central repository for uh, folks uh, statewide to, to get better information about uh, invasive species in our, in our, um, our whole program. Um, and another thing uh, that I want to mention um, in just to put a little, little, little B in, in people's minds, if, if you have an interest, um, it's been released that, that DEC developed and we released a, uh, um, a school curriculum on uh, invasive species for, um, for grade school age children. And um, we had staff loss with our education outreach coordinator, but uh, are still looking and would, would like to further the use and distribution of that curriculum. It's, it's really great. It's helped developed in part with Merck State Ed. Um, so that's something that if you are interested in uh, perhaps through engagement with your uh, local school or whatever capacity, we'd, uh, we'd love to uh, try and help get that uh, curriculum out a little more broadly. Um, and I'll, I'll leave it at that. If, you, if there's any specific questions, maybe I could, I could field now or, or later. It's, it's up to, uh, I guess, to Mara to uh, govern my time. But uh, are still on. we can take questions um, towards the end. I do know that um, we've had some great presentations so far and we're running a little bit behind. I think what I'm going to do is move our break to 11 o'clock and we'll adjust the schedule after that accordingly, because I do want to make sure that we have a chance to hear from APA as well as DOT, uh, our other founding partners, before we get to the break. And I think, Kathy, are you on from APA? Kathy or Lee from APA? Can, can you hear me? I can, great, thanks. I was <laughs> muted twice and didn't realize it. Sorry about that. Um, thank you very much for giving us the opportunity to talk today. Um, as you guys heard, the uh, Hemlock Woolly Adelgid was found this summer, and I got an email late in the summer from Zach saying, hey, can we use your, our general permit in order to treat this? And we took a closer look at it and we said, oh, no, you can't. So we had to go through a full permit application. We got it through in record time so that the treatments could start. Um, and hopefully that worked out well. But it, it identified the need to amend our general permit. So our general permit, as it's written now, is for the management of terrestrial invasive plant species, emphasis on plant, within 100 feet of the wetlands. And what we've done is we have modified this um, and we brought this to our board in October and our board uh, 
approved us going out for public comment. We now have a public comment period that ends in on November 20th. And Tamara, can you go to the next slide, please? I think it has the address. Yes, thank you. So what we've done is we've amended this general permit so that it um, includes the management of both terrestrial plant and non-plant species. We also made it so that it's for uh, management in or impacting wetlands and not just within 100 feet. The general permit is available on our website and the materials are there that you can take a look and um, I would appreciate people taking a close look at it because I pulled this together pretty quickly and when I do that I tend to be sloppy and make mistakes so I would love to hear from you. The other thing that um, we would like to report on is the uh, we're Lee, I should say we, Lee, is finalizing a new permit application for the use of the aquatic pesticides to control invasive species. As you may or may not know that um, this summer uh, Minerva Lake was treated, it was using Priscilla Core to treat Eurasian milfoil, and we realized that this is going to happen much more often. So we're trying to make it a little bit easier for people to apply for these permits. So that is being drafted right now. And as far as the results of the Priscilla Core treatment, the final report is not expected out until December, and when it's out, we will share it with you. And that's what I have for the agency. We're not taking a break yet. <laughs> uh, sorry. Um, so thank you for that, Kathy. Lots of issues going on with APA also related to invasives. And certainly our last partner that we want to hear from before our break this morning is Department of Transportation. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And I believe, Ed, are you going to share your screen or did you want me to pull up the new, the slides for you? Look, Ed has start, started sharing and we're ready to roll. And so I'd like to introduce Ed Franz from the Department of Transportation, who is really the lead, but many of our other different uh, regional Department of Transportation folks are absolutely essential to the work that we're doing to control invasives in the Adirondacks. And Ed in particular for helping us find or identify the emerald ash borer there in Warren County. You're up, Ed. Ed, you may be on mute. We can't hear you yet. How about now? Perfect. All right, great. Um, okay, I'm gonna go through some stuff here quick. I just, one thing I just wanna to mention to folks, people may be aware, but um, we have implemented our travel corridor unit management planning process. It's not that we haven't been doing this for years, but we've been always operating under the presumption when we got involved with helping to start APIP in the 90s that invasives were certainly one of the greatest threats. And I think we still all recognize that the transportation corridors are still a primary conduit for um, you know, the spread of invasives and the, and the introduction. So I'm gonna go through a few things. We'll go through kind of quickly. Um, let's see here. So, you know, we've got multiple, you know, folks, you know, we have three regions in the park in various locations. We've done some treatments this year from, you know, herbicide treatments to hand pulling. Um, We've done some work, you know, in particular, we've been monitoring a lot of our projects as far as when we're, we're out there, we have ongoing construction projects. A few years back, we built an access road to the top of Blue Mountain, which was instrumental in broadband and also other, you know, um, you know, state police and other communication systems that are critical in the park. And, you know, this picture just uh, removing, there's a lot of, uh, Napweed and other species, and just a day of pulling as we were out there. Um, yeah, and multiple sites that we did some, you know, herbicide treatments. It was a little bit limited this year, as, as with everybody with COVID, things were different, um, even with our operations folks and the time and effort that we could do. Um, 
One of the things that I just point out is that back in the 90s when we really got involved with this, when we realized how much purple loosestrap got introduced between Long Lake and the county line to the north, we at that time estimated 20,000 plants. It's when we all started getting together and APIP started becoming what APIP is today. That was really the result of bringing in mulch. And, and we focus on things, we're trying to focus on things that have broad application. And if you drive around today, it's amazing how that changed. Now, I hardly ever see anything but straw mulch or weed free type mulches being used. And I see that all throughout the state now too, but it wasn't a common thing back in the 90s. And one of the things that's important is also we're looking at our mowing and we've been talking about this and looking at the vectors and the things that cause the spread of invasives. Um, so we're doing some things throughout the park. We're, we're certainly not fully there. I'm going to show some slides further, but we're looking at our mowing, getting the mower decks raised up, trying to keep the equipment off of steep slopes where they can cause scour. And we get a lot of species like the nap weeds coming in. The other thing we're really looking at is all of our facilities and making sure that we can get rid of any invasives that we have in our facilities. We don't want to have these there and then be moving out from our operational facilities. Warrensburg is a great example. We did a training there a few years back. As part of the training, we did kind of an inventory and work with staff to show them the different invasives. And we had a pretty good stand of Phragmites at that location. And that, that Phragmites has been knocked back over 99%. Our staff have been treating that. And um, so we're doing that and trying to get every residency, sub-residency, every facility in the park screened and work on a plan to eliminate invasives. Training this year was a little bit more limited, but we, you know, we have different avenues that we've used. Um, we have an online training system we use too. Uh, but staff did do some training uh, with staff in the field. We did not do a formal training like we've been doing for over 10 years with ACIP. We usually do one to two at a facility and sometimes have upwards of 50 staff at these trainings. But we continue to do different things and we're looking at things uh, even like spotted lanternfly. Um, the boat wash, you know, we've been involved with that for years too, helping out where we can, uh, doing some improvements at some of our locations. So that partnerships have been continuing. Um, we have in our, we call our capital program, we have staff. And again, I have talked about this. This is input from all three of our regions and staff that are involved either in our operations or in our capital program or construction division. And so, um, you know, I know Region 2 is pretty active in making sure that they're paying attention to cleaning equipment and something we're looking at park-wide when we have projects coming into the park, making sure equipment coming from other parks aren't bringing something with it. Um, it's just a note at the bottom. One of the things we're looking at is um, getting a seed collector. Hamilton County is looking to put in for a grant this month. We've got to get some, some prices and some estimates. We want to move forward on being able to collect some of our native seeds, such as our little blue stem and big blue stem and some of the other native grasses that grow along our right of ways. We have plenty of places like the Northway and some of our wider corridors that have the opportunity for this. We did borrow a seed collector from USDA Big Flats about 10 years ago. We collected seed at the Saratoga Battlefield. Some of those locations where we use that seed today are looking great. Um, but that goes to another thing. We're looking at, uh, we've, we've got working groups on two really important topics. I will say three. One is on reestablishment of vegetation when we have to disturb the ground. And of course, we're emphasizing with all staff, whether it be operations design, minimize where you disturb. So that's the first approach. Don't cause any more disturbance than you have to. And then we want to move our way down to reutilize the soils that are there. Don't bring in topsoils. Um, from other places in the state, they tend to have invasives. We need to work with a seed mix that works in the Adirondack Park. So we have a working group on reestablishing vegetation. We have guidance that's 95% complete. It will be released. It'll be part of our Adirondack Park guidelines for the park. We have a working group working on the whole concept of use of soil and um, you know the, the concept of topsoil. We did a training here in a site go through with Hamilton County. Uh, soil and water and their use of this product called Proganics. 
and using that through a hydro seeder. And so we're going to look at doing some test areas with some of the native seed, but essentially it's an organic material that doesn't have invasives, and you don't need, you know, topsoil to get stuff reestablished. Another thing that we're looking at that does have definite, a definite relationship to what we're looking at with our mowing team is that there, the monarch may be listed, um, and this whole effort is being done across the country. And one of the things is to essentially uh, establish some protocols so that if it does get listed that we have certain conservation measures in place and that we have certain guarantees that can be monitored so that you know we're not having an incidental take every time we mow something and maybe you know kill a monarch um, so it's a it's a whole program we're looking at but it ties right into looking at how we're managing our right of ways not just in the park but outside the park the big thing that I think is really important is this whole concept of vegetation management. And we've had this in the department and there's, there's things that we've been pushing and we are working on some guidance for the park. And we're working with our main office operations division and we're now moving to do develop guidelines that'll be implemented for the entire state. And I'm just gonna breeze through these quickly just to give you kind of an idea, but essentially establishing mowing zones with certain criteria and with this also being training and what we're getting in these areas this is a good picture where you can see this is all tall white sweet clover it's in that first area and if you look at our highways anywhere the more you intensely mow the more you get non-native species so this is where you'll get your map weeds your tall white sweet clover and the further you get away from the road you tend to get more of the native vegetation the part so the gentleman standing that's all milkweed and goldenrod and so the, the idea is to get our folks thinking about mowing these safety zones. Oftentimes we spend the whole time mowing the entire right away and then the white sweet clover and the napweeds release their seed. And we want to focus on getting these safety zones mowed early before they produce seed and limit our mowing in the operational zone, maybe to even every other year, every third year. Uh, certainly, we don't want trees and brush growing up, so we're going to look for other management of those species in those locations. And this was an area on 28, and some of the work that Becky Miller, the MEC, the maintenance environmental coordinator, really helped move that region this year to look at just mowing limited areas. And uh, they used an over the guide rail mower for a lot of their mowing for limiting ground disturbance on some of the corridors where they get steep and, and the soils are unstable. And again, this is kind of what you would have in this vegetation management plan and um, really look at how we're going to start managing and mowing in the park and how this influences spread of the basis. So that's all I have and uh, appreciate everybody's time and we're looking forward to continuing. And again, I think that we're trying to work on broadband things that have a bigger influence on the entire park. Certainly treatments are important. But our facilities, our mowing guidance, our reestablishment of vegetation when we do have to disturb the soil, and certainly reutilizing the soils and not looking to bring in topsoil. So thank you. Excellent. Thanks, Ed. And if you don't mind stopping screen share, that'll be great. I'll pull mine back up. Um, just want to thank Ed in, for his leadership at DOT. We have been really fortunate to have DOT at a partner as well as the three active regions of DOT, uh, Adirondack Park Agency, great partner and responsive this summer as we were looking for permits, DEC in terms of its curriculum and the forest pest staff and all the connections with the PRISMs. I'm excited that we're going to get to hear a lot more about what our partners are doing when we return for our 